All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined all the way from Chiswick in West London by Matthew Stiver. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm very well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, and, and Matthew is the CEO of Articulate Marketing, a writer, marketer, pilot, entrepreneur, computer games geek, apparently not in that particular order. <laughs> <laughs> and what we're going to talk today about is a tech com how a tech company can differentiate itself and stand out from the crowd. Um, so let's get straight into it, Matthew, because, I mean, obviously we're a technology company ourselves, and um, there is the certain... There is a kind of perception among customers today um, that technology companies are all interchangeable. You know, they basically all do the same things. Um, so there's and there's so many of them anyway in the marketplace that it's really hard to differentiate. And basically, if you get one, you probably are going to be OK. So it's almost commoditized, if you like, the perception wise, it, it's, uh, you know, tech companies tend to regardless of what technology it is, tend to be perceived as somewhat commoditized. And that obviously raises the challenge of differentiation. Yeah, absolutely. Commoditization, I think, is the end result of undifferentiated companies, but it's it's not why they're undifferentiated. Um, I think if you go, if you trace this all the way back, tech company founders the people who sort of decide the culture, the branding, the identity of the business initially, you know, what got them started was the technology. So they, they're really mm -hmm. interested in the technology. I mean, in your case, you know, the founders are really, in, you know, interested in CRM. They want to mm -hmm. do, you know, do CRM software. But people who buy CRM software or whatever the technology is that you're flogging, are not interested in creating technology. They're not technologists. Some of them might be, but for the most part, they're not. What they're interested in solving some problem or making something better or dealing with some issue or moving their business, achieving their life goals or whatever it is, right? Um, so, you know, in the old days, you know, we were just talking about the, the 90s and the sort of dot-com boom, okay? PC manufacturers were talking about, you know, speeds and feeds and faster processes and megabytes and whatever. And Apple, think different. It was a mm -hmm. different positioning. They were talking about something that was connecting emotionally and imaginatively to their buyers who they identified as you know, largely creative types who are willing to pay more for design. So that is a, the classic classic example of tech differentiation and the reason is i think also in the pc world everybody was looking at their competition and looking you know seeing them seeing themselves in the mirror like you know mm -hmm. compact yeah. looking at hp who was looking at dell they were like we've got to be faster than them cheaper than them we've got to look the same as that we've got to have the that it sort of becomes almost self commoditizing and i, mm. I think i think the challenge there for for tech entrepreneurs, tech marketers like me, is how do you find the thing or the things that talk to customers about their issues in their language that appeal to them, that resonate with them, and stop talking about your stuff in your language? And the analogy I sometimes use is the difference between sushi and cold dead fish, right? They both mm -hmm. describe the same thing, but sushi is an exotic and exciting and appetizing meal, healthy and all that good stuff. Cold dead fish is really mm -hmm. unappealing, but very technically accurate description of what you're eating. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of technology companies are guilty of selling cold dead fish. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree to you. I would agree with you. And I think uh, to your point of when everybody was kind of looking at each other, I think being different is a little bit scary um, because mm -hmm. uh, if you say, OK, everybody in my space, you know, they all promote this and we should maybe make sure that people understand, you know, we're the same as them. But once you make people understand you're the same as them, you're there equating yourself to them or you're going for little differentiations that don't actually matter. Yes. Price is a dreadful way of differentiating yourself. A feature table is a terrible way of differentiating yourself. You know, um, speeds and feeds, terrible way of differentiating yourself. So let's maybe think about some of the good yeah. ways that you can do this. And I understand that it's hard, right? Starting with a deep, validated understanding of 
your customers, who your ideal customer is and their needs and their pain points and their problems and their challenges and their goals. So that sort of um, uh, everyday anthropology, business anthropology, I think is really, really important imaginatively to start there. Secondly, I think you can pick some of this toolkit of differentiation. You can find a product feature and accentuate it and invest in it that differentiates you. You know, uh, you can find some tone of voice and language and branding that differentiates you. Um, I think you can present what you do in a different way. So I think website design, website copywriting, the messaging of your product, that's really you know a way of going, yeah, all those other people are talking about speeds and fees, but we're think different or we have the thing that solves this. You can be very um, specialized in a niche, in an area. Mm -hmm. So you know, geographically or for customer demographics. I mean, HubSpot started out selling software to lawyers. I probably shouldn't mention HubSpot on this call with you, but, oh, you know, you're fine. Mm -hmm. they, they started somewhere. Mimecast is another company that sells, you know, email security. They started massively in professional services, lawyers and accountants. You know, so that, that kind of, we really understand you Mrs. Customer, Mr. Customer, you know, you, your problems, your world. And we're not bothered about, all, you know, trying to be everything for everybody, but we're, we're like that. So in, in our, our world, we've come across, uh, we do a lot of work with IT specialists, managed service providers, um, um, people like that. Mm -hmm. And they are absolutely indistinguishable from one, from one another. And they're all spouting out the same VMware, Microsoft, vendor language about digital transformation, right? right. right blah, 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 blah. And that there are, in my opinion, two MSPs in the UK that are massively differentiated from everybody else. And then everyone else is almost the same with like 5% mm -hmm. DNA differences. Right. And the two that are differentiated, one sells to restaurants and the other one sells to dentists. So they're right. really, really vertically specific. But if you are a dentist in the UK, there's a 40 to 50% chance you use that MSP right they have mm -hmm. they've literally own that market and I, I just think that's genius that that's not the only way of differentiating yourself but in a very commoditized market it's a very effective way yeah and it's and it's interesting because i mean some people it's maybe it's not that exciting to say okay we're going to own the dental market right <laughs> um, but to your point is is um that's where you can really create differentiation by understanding the market you're in when you when you're a when you're a broad solution obviously that is uh that's a lot more difficult um but back to your back to your point earlier is um is getting out of your own head a little bit isn't it it's like getting out of your own being in love with your own product and all of that and really kind of looking at how people use it because at the end of the day and you've probably come across this you know a lot is that customers will use the product in ways that you never imagined they would in different ways. And those are the things that you need to pay attention to. Yes. So actually looking at how people engage with your products and looking at where they, that where they sort of probe the edges of it, whether you're selling a piece of software and you're seeing people do like weird use cases of mm -hmm. it, that can be very enlightening because it could show you, you know, if you suddenly find 20% of your users are do, using this in an unexpected way, there's a new feature. There's there's a sort of antidote to that. There's a sort of well, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism sometimes talks about near enemies and far enemies, and the near enemy of that is is you know you look too closely and you go okay we've got a product that does this and therefore we need to add this feature and this feature and this feature because our competitors are fat and mm -hmm. our competitors have that i call this microsoft word com competition differentiation right there is a button in microsoft word that does so everything anything you want to do with word processing. And here at Articulate now, we use Notion for pretty much everything in the business, for copywriting and collaboration. And it just doesn't have this ribbon of you know buttons. It, there's no, well, there is an equation editor, but you have to go mm -hmm. find it. It doesn't have this sort of, because it doesn't have to compete feature for feature with Word. Word won that battle 20 years ago, but now Notion's come along with something that's actually more useful and does some other thing better. I, and I think I think so that you, you kind of need to tune into the things that differentiate, but also I think as a tech developer or a tech business, say no to things. That's another really powerful way to differentiate, right? If you're the dentist MSP and you say to no to 
you know, I don't want to do your grocery shop or I don't want to do your other mm -hmm. business. I do dentists. And maybe in a couple of years, we might start doing doctors and maybe vets, right? Mm -hmm. we, know, we know enough about this world that we could do that and that. I think focus is really valuable. Um, there's another little trick up my sleeve that I just wanted to share you, and I call it the mm -hmm. MacGuffin, right? It's sometimes it can be really, really clever just to come up with like a little, like a name of a thing that you do or that you have. Um, you know, we've we've seen companies with sort of Insight 360 or something like that, and you know, it does it asks you some questions and then it benchmarks you, and that becomes it's a little marketing thing, a little bit mm -hmm. of pre-sales thing. But the fact that they've got a little trademark part by it, and they've got a methodology and a process and a thing that they do, you you can often find a, a little um, north star in your business that you can trademark or service mark, and you can put that at the front of the business. And it's a thing you've got that nobody else has got because you invented it, you named it, you trademarked it. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a really interesting interesting observation. I mean, we kind of did the, did it ourselves when we brought out our workflow automation engine. Let's face it, workflow automation engine is not a very exciting title, so we called it the automatizer. And now everybody, <laughs> the people refer to it. At the beginning, people were even customers were going like um, that automa thingy. What is it called? The automatizer. That's it, automatizer. And now, uh, because it's such a goofy name and everything, so people mm. love it. Yeah. yeah. And being a bit goofy can work for some companies, right? I mean, I think actually a little bit of wit and charm, a little bit of irony. We we, we go long on irony and, and sort of dry wit on Articulate's website. Um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't work for everybody. We're a, we market to tech companies and a lot of them, you know, bless them, don't have this sort of great sense of humor, but some of them do. And some of them love that vibe and they go, I want that for my business. Mm -hmm. I want I want some um, you know a bit of tongue in cheek humor and and that that's great. I, I, it, it can be overplayed. I mean I think in the UK we have innocent drinks and you know you see these sort of rather glib sloganizing, uh, but it can work. It can work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you, and right? the, what's that? It works for you, right? With yeah, no, it works absolutely. Like Our automatizer, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a bit of a tongue twister, but people love it. Once they get the hang of it, then they all start. And then they start talking excitedly about automating things. And it's almost like sometimes they start with the the, con the automatizer. Well, that sounds cool. And then they realize actually it's highly, highly functional and very can drive a lot of efficiencies. So, you know, I, 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 to I totally agree with you. But we seem to be caught, though, um, <clears throat> in this, in this, um, on the, stuck on this roundabout though it's in in the tech industry you know particularly in the in SaaS businesses here of i mean people are sort of changing everything constantly like the latest buzzword comes out like maybe it's customer centricity or it's whatever whatever the, the latest bumper sticker is and and therefore it's hard sometimes to know what people's identity are, is because they keep kind of changing it or, or accentuating something different like mm -hmm. it's almost like the the slogan du jour yeah, I, I know. And I, as a writer, I'm a, I was a freelance journalist for Wired and mm -hmm. people like that. And then I've been right. 20 years as a marketing copywriter. It drives me crazy, right? These, these acronyms and jargon phrases and solution as a word I don't like to see on a website. And that's just been around forever. Um, but there's a sort of there's a sort of fashion to it. I mean, people think if 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 I am in the you know digital transformation mm -hmm. space or something, I can get funded, or as you say, whatever the bumper sticker of the day mm -hmm. is, whatever the hot thing that is you know VCs are putting money in. And I think there's I think um, uh, Jason Fried and the Basecamp people have a really very strong, valid opinion about building your business for benefit of your customers and to make money from the start, rather mm -hmm. than building your business for financial engineering. And I think there's a lot of VC funded tech companies that their, their real customers are the investors. Yep. And the, you know, the people out there who are paying for their software or whatever, they're sort of in, in, in it for the ride. And they're sort of, you know, in, there's, I mean, clearly you have to get them, but it, I, I find that very upsetting. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur, but I've always tried to run a business as a business rather than jumping on the next bandwagon.
Yeah, yeah. No, you're 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 singing from the same hymn sheet as us here. Um, we totally agree with that as well. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that is a lot of the model now. Is you know, there's a, you know, get a get a, a product that does enough. Go get the VC money. Dump ninety percent of it into sales and marketing rather than into actually making <clears throat> the product as valuable as it can be. And then, um, yeah, make money for the original investors when eventually it gets acquired or whatever, or it bombs and everybody loses. But, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we have to, I think that's where a lot of the times why people struggle with differentiation in particularly in the tech space is because they haven't actually put enough thought into the product itself. Yeah. And, and the thought about the product starts with the problem you're trying to solve for the customer. Yes saying yes to the right things and saying no to most things. It, and that's really, really hard. I know. I mean, I, I, I set up and ran a software company, which I'm, is still going and I'm you know, successful as a sort of side gig. And TurbineHQ.com, and it, we, it does online purchase orders and expense claims. And we use it at Articulate. We built it for Articulate and then spun it out as a business. Mm -hmm. And the temptation so often is, you know, somebody goes, ah, oh, but if only you could do this thing in it and would buy it if it did have that feature mm -hmm. and this other company product has all these. And the thing that I have learned in more than 10 years of running that is actually killing features is much more effective than adding features, enriching mm -hmm. the small set of core features that really make a difference to people. And then, you know, it's actually okay to say to somebody, I mean, this is this is heresy. I'm going to be shot by the, the, the dot-com startup brigade. It's actually okay to say, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice 10% of my potential customer base in the next two years by not spending six months developing a feature that only 10% of them will use and most people won't and most people won't value it. I'm going to take that resource and I'm going to make this feature, which 100% of my customers use, I'm going to make it twice as good you know, faster, easier, better, you know, whatever works on my phone. And I think that re reinforcing and investing in what works is really, really critical. I mean, at the end of the day in tech, in tech, the product is the differentiator. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that really works. And if, if you're in tech services, which in part we are and, 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 and you know, a lot of our clients are, you still need the fundamental technology, the delivery of the product to work. And that, so, you know, that that's but finding the thing in it that positions you away from some everyone else that people resonate with. They like it. They want that. It makes a difference to their lives and then reinforcing that. As I said, I think it all comes back to understanding your customers and really, really paying attention to them. Um, yeah. And yeah, and like and, and to, to your point, I mean, I think that's unfortunately and not not a lot, not enough time is is spent on that because a, a lot of, we're, we're great at making making a lot of assumptions uh and and not ever really validating those assumptions until the until they're validated for us unfortunately and that's never a good thing <laughs> well it's it's very easy as a tech founder or it's very easy in life actually to to think mm -hmm. that the, the customer is the person in the mirror right the person that mm -hmm. you're, is going to buy your software or your product or your technology or your service they have the same needs, goals, and ambitions that you do. I, I, I speak as a lifelong entrepreneur. I mean, I started my first mm -hmm. business when I was 18. And um, so I, I find it uh, impossible to understand the mentality of employees. I, it's, I have to really work to kind of like, why don't they think like I think? Why don't they have the, mm -hmm. you know, why isn't everyone running their own business? And, and so, you know, I have to apply that sort of um, mental recalibration all the time now I have a whole load of people who work for me. Um, and I think it's the same if you're running a business. You know, you the, the thing that you're expert in, the thing that you know about that brought you to start the business, the thing that, you know, the, the world that you live in as an entrepreneur, as a tech startup, as a founder, as a business person, mm -hmm. that isn't the, the world that your customers inhabit. They have their own stuff to deal with, and they're the heroes of their own story, right? You need to go out and be Gandalf to the, them. They're, they're the hero of the story. You're there to support and help and encourage and direct and motivate them not not to project yourself onto them yeah no that's that, that's beautifully put and and i love also just wanted to come back to the idea of what you said is like not always adding things but like focusing in energy on on things that you're making them the best they can be for the majority of your customers it's like i always remember 
if, if you do strategic planning sessions, right, and you people sit around and you're brainstorming and say, okay, you know, what could we do? And people come up with loads of ideas and you're filling flip charts and then you go, okay, now what will we stop doing? And so yeah. there's silence. Nobody, nobody wants to actually stop doing yeah. anything. That's it. We're hardwired like that, which is kind of bit, which I was find fascinating. The don't do list is a very powerful thing, right? Um, this, you know, you've got your to do list, and you've got your I'm not doing this anymore. Um, yeah. But I find it very hard to say no to people, and so I fill my days with meetings and obligations to people. Um, I, I, I think saying no is incredibly powerful, and we all need to get much better at it. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I think the the other part of that is that you alluded to earlier is, you know, saying no and then saying, yeah, we don't do that uh, and we're not going to do that. We we're focusing on this. And and it's hard sometimes, as you said, to to a customer, you might get like very tempted. Oh, yeah, we could do that. And yeah, then maybe that. And then, of course, it happens what you said. Then that becomes Ooh, that could maybe be a product of its own. And suddenly you're completely distracted. So yeah. getting back to what you said earlier, I think focus is so critical. Um, listen, all of uh, Matthew's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and Articulate. Well, crikey. Um, so <laughs> I've been running Articulate for nearly 20 years. Before that, I was a freelance journalist. And before that, I designed computer games. I designed games for Lego. So look, here are, here's some of my, I'm still a bit of a Lego geek. Um, oh, yeah. So if you want to read my blog about technology, geekiness, Lego, computer games, and management, I'm at geekboss.com. Um, but the, my day job is, is, is helping tech companies differentiate and position themselves and communicate with their customers and build beautiful, delightful websites and all that lovely stuff. And we're at articulatemarketing.com. Um, there's lots of free stuff there, lots of blog posts and webinars. You know, don't, you know if you want to come buy from us, great, but that come, come, come for the blogs and stay for the business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a fantastic website. Yeah, I can encourage you to go check it out. As I said, it'll be below this video. Uh, well, listen, thank you again, Matthew. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.